So um, as Mika commented in the message, I can't remember if she sent it to everybody or just to me, but it was a reminder about uh, Salem's and his important role in the, in the Vietnam War and uh, creating teachings. And so, so he was um, more activist than this article might make it appear and left uh, quite a heritage in that respect. Um, what I thought I might do with this article, which is more, um, more academic, but has lots of important implications for us, is run through um, some of the earlier things where we could end up talking about it a lot, but they're not the real point, which I think are some of the issues he raises at the end. And if, if that's all right with people, I will do that. But first of all, um, is there anything that really leaps out that people would like to talk about first from their from their reading? At the end of the at the end of the paper, um, Stalin says something um, interesting. So the the title of the paper is two or three things I know about culture. And he says that uh, he basically wanted to say a lot of things so that we remember two or three things. So maybe mm -hmm. one thing that we could um, we could do after after your presentation, Ellen, is um, maybe to think about two or three things that we um, we we think that uh, are important in that paper, and um, maybe for us, but also it's interesting to read that. I mean, we all know uh, uh, David's work uh, quite well here, so maybe think about like. Two or three things that he um, he also used in his own work. Okay, that that sounds good. There, I certainly did think that uh, the the points of connection did become clear towards the end, as you point out. So so we can certainly do that. So um, maybe I'll just since we're not all anthropologists, uh, I, I I'm not sure how interesting this is, but I'll just run through some of the initial things. Here, um, he, he spends the first part of the article uh, really defending the importance of the culture concept. And he's writing because he, he feels that there's some people who aren't giving um, some of the concepts implicit in it uh, quite the value that, that it should have. And he's wanting to emphasize, I think, um, because he wrote this for JRAI, um, for social anthropologists, He's wanting to underline culture, which is the key concept in American cultural anthropology. And his real point is um, here is in many ways that symbolism is absolutely fundamental to our species. It's not that you know, um, other species might not have something similar. We don't have to get into that discussion at all. But just to think about how important symbolism is to, um, for, for humans. It's absolutely basic to how we think about ourselves. I mean, you know, try think, thinking about ourselves or anything we care about without using language or concepts at all. So symbolism is absolutely fundamental and he's wanting to underline that he thinks that is really what anthropology is about and that sometimes gets lost in an emphasis on um, action or society. And it's not that he doesn't think those things are important. He comes back and underlines their importance at the end. What he's saying is that you can't, in his view, make adequate sense of them without understanding the symbols that we bring to bear on everything we do. And one of the things that you could do in that sense to get at what he's thinking about is you could just take um, a minute or 30 seconds or whatever um, to Create a list of all of the things that you could possibly do that wouldn't involve symbolism or meaning. It's going to be a very short list, right? <laughs> you know, in fact, it's hard to put anything on it at all. So basically, the, the idea is I, I could leave a longer time, it would work better, but I don't want to waste your time either. The idea is basically the symbolism imbues everything we do. Um, and that is really what he's trying to get at with the concept of culture. Um, he's also wanting to emphasize um, how shared it is and how it's shared in a way in which we may not be fully conscious of it so that it gets imbued in us um, from the very beginning of our lives. And he, he wants to emphasize how much of that is just 
intrinsic to the human condition and with us from our very birth and acquired from the people around us. Um, so some of it is that it's there and we may not be fully aware of how much is there. Um, he also wants to underline how structured it is. And I think the question of structure, um, that symbolism to exist requires some degree of structure, but how we think about that structure is really complicated is one of the things that we're going to want to return to at the end. So one of the things he's emphasizing uh, is that structure is essential to culture. And that's one of the things, one of these two or three things that he's trying to point out. Uh, one of the things we also need to understand that he's not emphasizing quite as much because it's not the purpose of his article, but he certainly wouldn't deny it, is that um, what we do with culture, what we do with symbols is incredibly creative. Um, so that although it's shared, we can be um, full of initiative, originality, um, and creativity in terms of how we use it. So that you know, we need to, um, we don't just repeat the same utterances in, when we're speaking to each other. We know how to use whatever language we happen to, to share with the people around us in ways that are, allow us to be constantly producing unique utterances that are meaningful and recognized as meaningful. So there's an openness as well as structure that's quite complicated. And that's one of the things that uh, we could talk about at the end, because that's something that's not fully developed here, but I think he's understanding. So some of it is he's arguing for the importance of symbolism just in the first few pages. Then what he wants to talk about um, more intensely is this question about recognizing the existence of structure. And some of this article is um, written against certain views uh, that he attributes to um, Hobsbawm and the invention of tradition argument or to, to postmodernism. And I think when he's talking about the invention of uh, tradition argument from Hobsbawm, uh, which I remember from long ago, my notion of it is certainly that it's a powerful concept for understanding how we sometimes reframe our traditions in ways that um, are very problematic. So that you know, speaking as a Canadian, we've a few years ago went through this whole notion that Canada was formed through its participation in the World War I, which is a tradition I would totally reject and think is an invented tradition. But basically a lot of the time, uh, the point, there's a sense in which we do have to deal with invented traditions, um, but it's not to say that all tradition is invented. And he's wanting to say that culture is alive and well and has a, has a continuity. It is not just whatever we want it to be and whatever we try to redefine it as being, which I don't think was ever what Hobsbawm was saying, but he's uh, wanting to reject the idea that um, we have a great deal of freedom um, or limitless freedom in terms of how we remake the culture that we have. And he's not denying human agency, but he, I think he feels that um, in this tension between agency and structure, he feels compelled to write against um, the hubris of thinking that we can just remake our culture however we like, whenever we like. And I'm not entirely certain very many people ever said that, uh, but that's the position he wants to, to argue against. And he's wanting to ask that we um, think a little bit more about the challenges of dealing with having been born into certain kinds of cultures and structures that may condition what we're thinking more than we realize, condition the thinking of the people with whom we share the culture. So he rejects an absolute opposition between these things. He's against extreme individualism. Um, and uh, he, he possibly overstates this a little bit because he's not completely trying to reject agency. He's obviously a person who exerts a great deal of agency within his own culture. Um, so you can sort of see that he's preserving that. He's worried about um, that, that problem of uh, possibly overemphasizing um, 
how much we can remake our culture just as an act of will. He sees it as a more complicated thing in, involving human resources um, and more than the individual. So he's seeing it as intensely shared as well. So some of this is a, an argument against individualism and he, um, that's maybe an exaggerated notion of individual agency. And he puts this, he phrases this in terms of taking on the invention of tradition school or taking on postmodernism. I'm not certain we have to talk about his critique of postmodernism a great deal because that doesn't seem to be a preoccupation of this reading group. If, if people want to come back to it and, and want to talk about Foucault more or whatever, we, we could do that. Um, so I think uh, what he wants to say is that um, culture can be instrumental and we can change it. Um, but he makes a an, an distinction there. He wants to say that the fact that culture can be instrumental and that it can have political meaning and effects doesn't mean that it has no specific properties. So that it's important to look at the symbolism and not just to say, well, it's only about its consequences. We can just easily reject it as uh, instrumental or political. He's saying it's as a quality and embeddedness in our shared being together that we need to take seriously. Um, sorry, I'm just going to go into, okay. Um, Simone, do you want to talk about postmodernism now or come back to it a bit later on? No, I was, uh, I wrote it just for, uh, as a reminder for later. Okay, that's okay. fine. I, 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 I do agree with you. I think all of us are rejecting postmodernism, which is maybe why we didn't have to discuss it. <laughs> you know, so, but but I, I'm very happy to come back to it. Um, so I, I think that that isn't the bit that is particularly challenging um, for us. So I, I think that what he's wanting us to see is the weight culture may have in terms of um, how societies and, and people go about trying to create change in the world and that it may, uh, that it is intrinsically shared and we may not always be totally conscious of, of how it operates. Um, and maybe none of that is, I'm not sure that that's uh, contentious, as, a, as general statements, I think they're easy to accept. The problem comes when you get into uh, the specificity uh, of this. So some of the things that um, Solons is wanting that I think motivates him quite heavily in this article is uh, a feeling that um, the meaningfulness that culture has in people's lives is sometimes not being fully respected and that in particular cultural difference isn't being adequately respected. And he's wanting us to then see um, the weight that that has. And you could find that resonating with the dawn of everything, for example, in the weight that it gives to um, in indigenous, indigenous arguments and whether they were understood or respected in Europe and the effect that they've had. So what he, um, so we passed um, the question of his um, rejection of this idea that um, in, in postmodernism you can perhaps quite easily um, refuse a certain kind of um, epistem or um, pre existing culture. And I'm not certain that postmodernism needs to be dismissed that totally, but he's arguing that it um, puts forward that kind of position and that he wants to reject it as being essentially the same kind of argument that Leslie White came up with. Then he, what he turns to, uh, and with some of the connections with um, David and David is clear, is, and probably, it's, I'm sure it's what David Graeber brought to, um, one of the things he brought to the dawn of everything is the concept of schismogenesis. And, here, Solids is going into 
how important that idea is from, from Bateson. And that is one of the things that we could talk a little bit more about, about how culture is shared and it can be developed in a, in a dialectic uh, with neighboring cultures. And I think that that gives a sense of richness um, and, and social um, reality to something that might otherwise appear just to be um, ethereal yeah, in the sense of meaning. Uh, he's arguing in a sense that um, without cultural order, there is neither history nor agency. So he's trying to say that since culture imbues everything that we can possibly do, how could we think about doing things differently unless we take account of the way in which culture and symbolism imbue everything we do, provide us with both barriers to doing things differently and resources for doing things differently. So since symbolism meaning culture uh, permeate our entire existence, we need to take them into account. Now, I think that maybe it isn't too difficult for us to see that um, culture and symbolism in, in view human existence. How we think about it in a more specific terms is challenging. And it's challenging partly because we don't fully understand how our own minds work. Uh, and, and that's been a challenge for everybody reflecting on the human condition. So one of the things that we want to have are some better ideas about how we want to think about the structure that exists in culture. And I think that one of the particular things that he's wanting to emphasize here is that um, he wants to say very strong that culture is structured. And I think that you, the question of how it is structured is something that we need to think about, um, I think, much more closely. And he's basically just making the argument here that it is structured. And he doesn't give us a great deal to go on and to look at that structure. Uh, where I have where there's some reservations in my mind about what he's talking about here is that I think it's inescapable that there is some structure here, but I don't see it as being nearly as ordered um, as I think he's suggesting, although his text in this respect is, is somewhat ambiguous. And um, maybe um, I have a couple quotes here that I think I'll see if I can put quickly into, um, into chat. Um, okay, so that is just, um, I think something that I find a little bit more helpful, I think, than some of what um, Salins is putting in, in this particular article. This comes from Abner Cohen. Um, and Salins is emphasizing um, structure and a degree of homogeneity in culture. And while I think that there is structure and uh, we share things, the ways in which we share things is um, really complexly open. So if you look at this particular um, definition, for example, we have things that are standing ambiguously for multi a multiplicity of disparate meanings. And this is what we're working with all of the time in the way in which culture is ordered. It is actually, it is both structured and incredibly open or flexible. And it's more, less a matter of things being tied together um, or, or in fixed opposition than being hinged in a way that allows us to, um, or perhaps lightly pasted so that we can go and paste them somewhere else. I mean, it's a long discussion we could have about how to think about the dynamic potential and the openness of structure. Um, and a lot of this is stuff that we're um, not necessarily entirely conscious of. And I think in this sense, um, one of the, I'm just going to uh, see if I can bring up something else here for a moment. Uh, this is a, a link you can look at if you want. Um, 
and it's basically just an entertaining um, a little bit from, um, from BBC at one point um, that explains why green great dragons can't exist. And you can sort of amuse yourself with that. But it just says that you know, adjectives have to be put in a certain proper um, order. And that is one of just a, an entertaining example of the ways in which um, language limits our choices, but also gives us open choices at the same time. So I'll leave that for, for your amusement, um, perhaps. Um, the questions that I think uh, are presented here in some ways are um, an underlining of the importance of meaningfulness and cultural resources um, for how we're going to look at um, the issues of possibility um, that David, uh, David's work represents. And when we're looking at these possibilities, it's not as if they're totally unconstrained. And that's why he, does all, he has done all this research um, and use that to present evidence for the fact that people have been able to realize certain possibilities. And that is always on the basis of drawing upon cultural resources and doing it in shared activities with people. And what we need to understand more is how to look at where the positions of opening are, how they can get um, culturally developed um, and, and realized. And this is the bit that I think um, isn't, is, is why this issue matters. Um, because beyond looking at being able to break through a culture, it is where and how you break through, what you break through, um, how you use your culture to do it, how you can realize and keep something uh, continuing to constantly recreate it, and what resources we then have for being able to do it. And so those are all questions to which um, Solons and, and David Graeber are opening us up. And we have to look at symbolism and culture in order to be able to, um, to address those. Or at any rate, that's one of my takeaways from this. Um, I wouldn't say that Solomon's went all of the way there. He was basically trying basically to make us think more about culture. But I think if we want to think more about culture and not just say that it is a matter of um, being ordered, what he's really thinking about is we need to keep that in mind when we try thinking about how to get somewhere other than where we are. Uh, because if we're going to do that, we need um, to understand how, um, how symbolism works, um, how it may constrain us with structure, but also give us resources through which we can do something else. Um, and it, it's that kind of um, opening that he creates that I think um, David Graeber picked up on. And you can see that in, um, I think, all of his work, because in everything I've read at any rate, what he's doing is trying to challenge our ideas of what our culture gives us and being able to see different points of opening in it. And then to the, the way he's picked up on schismogenesis, to be able to look at some of the dynamics of how we have both uh, the same thing happening and different things happening at certain times as well. Um, and those would be some of the takeaways. And now I'm going to be quiet and listen to, to everybody else. Thank you, Ellen. Do we have any, any questions, comments? I saw a quick question about um, the funk, how the, the role of functionalism in this, he, he, he refers a lot to um, uh, this, the kind of theory that whatever, uh, uh, functionalism or, or structural functionalism, I guess they're two different things, but, um, um, and that, uh, that a huge amount of these arguments amount to functionalism, um, uh, as in, uh, it, 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 that, and that, that it was in fact that it was in fact a new functionalism that was that was part of some of uh, of of uh, uh, some of the some of the things he was critiquing was 
against functionalism. So I, I don't know why. So he doesn't, uh, Salins doesn't particularly agree with functionalism or structural functionalism. The idea that um, societies have, uh, well, certainly structural functionalism, society have structures to remain uh, uh, functional. Um, and that they, they're coherent, that if you didn't have these, the, the various structures they have, the society would fall apart and therefore all, all uh, these types of things are, are functioning. I didn't know if you wanted to comment on that. Sorry, I've made a hash of my question because I don't really, don't really know. No, it, it, it's quite important to his argument. I just thought it didn't connect quite as well with maybe the dawn of everything and so on. Basically, he's just talking about some of the differences here between American and British approaches. And um, he's suggesting, and, and I'm, he's suggesting that uh, British social anthropology and its heritage of structural functionalism, people like Radcliffe Brown, was all about looking at how society functions and that um, how people do things and, and the social relations and so on. And that really uh, the whole point is just to see how it works and to look at what is happening in social relations. And he wants to take this other approach that um, has been more, is perhaps more elaborated in American cultural anthropology, which is trying to examine the meaningfulness of culture. So he doesn't want to, he's trying to shift the emphasis from society to culture, uh, from um, social relations to, um, meaning systems, and it's um, a shift of weight between two intellectual traditions. And I think that both of them would say that both culture and society matter. They have different um, points of entry into it. And so that he's, I think, trying to defend the priority given to the culture concept in, in American cultural anthropology. Um, by saying that the structural functionalists reduce too much just to what happens rather than to why it happens in the specificity of culture. Um, so it's really just that that's basically his point that he didn't think people were paying enough attention to culture. Is that enough to explain? Do people agree or disagree or, I mean, he, he set it up as quite an opposition. I'm not certain it always has to be an opposition, but that, that makes for um, a good article, you know, and, and, it, and it's also real debates that go on where people do take, you know, in, in your research, you're going to prioritize some things at the expense of some other things. And he's has tended to prioritize culture, whereas some other people prioritize social relations. Is it against behaviorism or has it anything to do with the criti criticism against uh, behaviorism? Oh yes, behaviorism. He, I think he would, um, he certainly would reject that. Um, and I don't think he ever totally took that on. He, here he's taking on functionalism. He has a lovely little book on sociobiology, which he totally rejects. Um, and, and it's a wonderful, passionate read. So I think that what he, he's rejecting um, all of those oppositions between culture and nature and any form of reductionism. And I think that what he's worried about is that culture is the thing that gets, gets left out. So, so behaviorism is, I think, a form of reductionism, and and he's against um, all of those. Hi there. Um, I'm not an anthropologist, but I've tried to read a bit here and there, and I find is it sort of a, like a dilemma with words? Are we like culture and society as being too like this kind of dilemma of symbolism to mean more cultural but yeah I struggle with it this dualism that's at place and it seems like for 
yeah, a long time. There seems to be this dichotomy between culture and society. And I find like, uh, is it a language thing? Does that make any sense? Is that... Yes, on multiple levels. Um, I think that um, one thing we might have to do mentally is to be able to see contrast between things in order to have some some clarity about um, what their nature is. But there's also, um, I think, a larger problem or, or, or a different, more specific problem that we might need to, to think about in terms of Western culture, if, if, that's, if that's a concept at all. But if some things arising out of the European tradition are very um, oriented towards looking at binaries. And um, what, do mean, what do you mean by binaries? Looking at binaries. Being in opposition, yeah, being okay. either or. And some of the time things are either or to an extraordinary degree in if it's this, it can't be that, yeah. rather than it can be this and that, you know, that what one can find in some other cultural traditions. So to, to some extent we get um there's been a lot of thought about why in some lines of European thought, we're so preoccupied with um, this or that and excluding certain patterns of thought if we want to accept one. So certainly what we are doing in this article is, or, or what he's arguing for um, by arguing for paying attention to culture is saying, don't leave it out when we're looking at society. So I think he, although in some ways the article reads as culture having priority over society, um, I think that really the point is that we need, he is in effect arguing for having the book put culture back in where we're talking about social. It seems like a, it seems like a sort of a form versus content. Where they say, they're so like, I don't know, reliant on each other. You know what I mean? Like. The humans, like, I don't know, all my separate organs, but they only work. My stomach and brain are one and the same. You know, which came first? It feels like that sort of, yeah, I don't know. I feel very lost but, with it. I think, I think that's the kind of argument that people are increasingly making in anthropology that you can't, for example, separate culture and biology. They, we're, we're biocultural entities, um, so that it all um, needs to be looked at uh, together. Which is a hard thing to do because the role of the anthropologist is so almost, I don't know, voyeuristic to then sort of get into these co other cultures' lives and then, I don't know, take authority. And there's sort of a power at play where, I don't know, the indigenous voice is spoken with, through Western motives. And I find it it's a, quite a predicament that sort of yeah, it's kind of a strange value system that's happening where, I don't know, I'm, yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. There's been, been I, great, I, there's been a great deal of criticism of exactly that. And I think that it means that anthropology has shifted and is um, trying to be much more engaged and has been talking about um, opening itself up to other voices. And to some extent, if, um, you know, there's a lot of literature that, because that's exactly the argument that you make. And I've listened to that a bit, but I find I found in recent years, if I'm presenting readings like that to, to my classes, I look out at my classes and I sort of think, that's not what I'm looking at anymore. <laughs> you know, the, the world has changed, anthropology has changed, many more people are here and, and doing it. So that I, I think that it's not always um, us talking about somebody else anymore um, and that anthropology can't go out and claim to have to be appropriating somebody else's life or world I mean I, I think of uh, what I've done for example is trying to go and learn from another culture and bring some of that richness back to explain to people yeah. but um, it's um, there was an interesting I don't know um, Terry Turner I think he was also mm -hmm. at um, Chicago. You heard of him, yeah. Terry Turner? 
There was yes. a um, fire, was it the fire of the Jaguar? I think David Graeber's written the, an introduction to it. But there's also some of Terry Turner's work with his video, his use of video. Um, and it's very, I, have, I've, I don't know, I looked through the book, I haven't got the quote to hand, but this idea of people being very critical of him giving video cameras to the people he was working with in the Amazon. And him sort of saying like, I don't know, this inverted colonialism that this primitive people couldn't comprehend the use of, I don't know, using this technology. And he was very criticized for trying to create a film with people. I don't know, I found it very fascinating, but yeah. Um, it, it was, and I think that um, there, there was um, a, a film, it may have been one he did that I remember using a, uh, quite some time ago um, in intro classes. And one of the questions would be, uh, what's going on with this film? And people, students were having, I mean, quite, it was quite a challenge for the students to realize that, oh, the indigenous people made this film. They're not the subject of the film. And it was really quite interesting because that shift was, was happening, that it was being, uh, the cameras were being put in, in, in other people's hands and they were creating their own works. And they're, that we're of course a long way down the road in that direction now. So okay. that is, um, so I, I think, Everything that you're saying is really um, yeah. I think I've I've just been important. I think there's another message that he, he's trying to um, get at here. Um, I think he's trying to say that in our very connected world right now, yeah. maybe we're having trouble seeing um, the cultural difference is still alive and well, and that even though we may all be using somewhat similar platforms and English is so hegemonic in some ways, there are really important differences and that we need to respect those and see how there are ways in which they're responding and becoming different to the hegemonic things that are being imposed as well. So I think that it's- um, It kind of becomes down to a, a bit of a play of power. It kind of comes down then to sort of power. And that seems a very sort of Western trap of the, it just becomes about sort of dominant voices. And I think that's, I don't know, where is, yeah, sorry. My, yeah. My. And he's trying to say that culture, thinking about culture is a resource against that. Um, Michael had his hand up. And I think- well, I was only gonna say, I had the same question of, about culture and society when I was reading it. And I tried to think, oh, it's almost thing. But you, you, it, when I was thinking about it, I was sort of like, well, um, it, it come, that kind of question of when people um, make a claim about our culture, um, they're in some ways usually trying to, to defend themselves and it is a collective interest. Whereas yeah, um, normally society is about the people you are, um, you, you're, you, you, you're, when you talk about society, you, you talk about power relations between different people, or you talk about, um, you know, something right close to you. So I, I think you, when I was thinking about it, you use the word slightly differently, um, but uh, culture and society. Um, so that that's, uh, but it's quite hard to, to just to try to take a dictionary definition of each and see what is on it. Sounds like the whole argument is a bit of, we should talk more collectively. And that is about culture because you can remark on how culture has collective differences. Um, whereas talking about society is just about individual differences between people. Um, uh, the only thing I could think of as funny is Margaret Thatcher made the claim there's no such thing as society. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like almost the same as in a place that never talks about culture. They're like culture was off the table even. So once they, you know, once they've got culture, then they'll go after society as well. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's kind of seems like the same kind of debate about if when you say no, there's no such thing as society, you're saying people can't talk about being together. And within anthropology, 
that's I think that's what Marshall Silence is in some ways arguing that we can look at people being uh, uh, having some type of together collective interests in a positive way is important when you look it, to be able to be when you talk using the word culture. I think to get past all this very academic discourse in some ways, what's going on is an effort to put people back in. You know, and whether we talk about it as culture or as society, the key thing is to put um, people back into to the social sciences. And that's not just a question for academic discourse, it's a question for our politicians, <laughs> as you gave us a, a good example there. So it's, um, I, I think that's what's being done. And it's in the nature of this kind of journal writing, I guess, um, for an academic journal that it becomes, it seems rather esoteric. Um, and if you don't dress it up like that, how do you get to publish something? It, it, it's one of those peculiar things, but that's the argument he's making. I think the Solons, I think is saying, if we don't pay attention to um, the meaningful elements of people's lives, people aren't in what we're doing. Um, and I, I have a question from Mika, and then Simona, I think, is going to follow up. Or Simona, are, maybe we've lost Simona for a minute. Um, do you want to leap into that, or shall I go to Nika's question? Oh, in chat? if you like. No, uh, go for Nika. OK. Well, I think that there is a problem with the things that articles we've been reading with Salons that um, it seemed on the topics we want to talk about, he's written things that seem to be very esoteric and you sort of wonder, why do I have to read this? And I mean, I, I, I do think that some of it is a little bit in the weeds and for um, very specialized arguments we don't have to pay attention to. But the, the things that, if I see something, um, to some extent, I think he's arguing against um, things that are maybe don't seem to be like extreme individualism and fantasies of unrestrained agency and so on. I, I think maybe don't need um, a long article, but or, or maybe you know, or maybe there are other ways to confront them. Um, the I, I think that there are some reasons why we do need to think about culture and why his effort to maybe bring us back to thinking about culture is worth doing. And I th think that if you look at that portion of David Graeber's life that was spent writing and teaching, he's trying to shift our culture. You know, that is very largely um, that portion of his life work that isn't also action and, and living. Um, so that, you know, there's almost a passionate commitment there that this matters. It matters to change how we think about debt. Um, it matters to think about all of the um, cultural resources that we, we bring to bear upon, uh, upon it. So I, I think that that's um, part of the argument that this, is, this really matters. And I think that it matters, I mean, the things that preoccupy me, I'll, and I, maybe we don't need to talk about those, but I'll just mention them in passing, is that beyond the critique of what we're living in that we don't like, we also need to know how to get to something different and to sustain it, um, how to not just break through, not, not, not to say, just to say have a jubilee, but to think our way through to a different kind of economy, uh, to realize some different way of living, and to recognize that we'll have to constantly correct and recreate it, and we'll need resources whereby we can continually do that. And those are questions of being able to build up a culture that has a different set of meanings and that realize them in different kinds of social relations. And that that's in the course of doing that, we have to draw upon um, our, our cultural resources. If When I see um, what's happening with 
uh, decolonization uh, in my country right now. Um, like, I might be the only Canadian on this on this call, but it's um, it's being taken apart by indigenous critique in really important ways. And the ways in which this are being done is largely through um, creation and recreation and um, the the use of cultural resources that are just alien to to many of us and that are really in, invigorating and and they're real and they have multi-generational depth and cultural resources can be used for this um, and that's where some of this can be can be relevant it might not need an awful lot of scholarly articles it might mostly need doing but in, in the doing of it these are some of the resources that we could be um, looking at uh, does that make any sense and Vasily has just mentioned um, but some of this is coming out right at the end of the article, where I think that it gets particularly interesting. Page um, from the page, um, it, it's there at um, page four thirteen. I think was what Vass was drawing attention to, and what he's doing there, by the way, he's making a pretty clear reference to the work of uh, Pierre Bourdieu. He just doesn't cite him explicitly, but it's recognizable. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, that's a wonderful quote. Uh, Simona, do you want to pick up here? Uh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'll be very confused because I'm thinking while I while I'm talking. But I I I need to try. Mm -hmm. um, first uh, consideration. Uh, what I experience, uh, uh, and I think it's uh, a common experience in these times, is uh, uh, not so much a dismissal of culture, but on the contrary, a uh, mystic of cul culture, of mm -hmm. cultural differences. Uh, mm -hmm. That is uh, uh, on the lower level an excuse for uh, uh, not taking into consideration people, actual people, uh, very practical uh, thing uh, when uh, dealing with uh, gypsy uh, children. Um, the teacher at my daughter's school said, oh, they can't uh, learn to write, uh, they are gypsies, it's their cult culture. Mm -hmm. and uh, all the arguments about uh, the clash of cultures. Uh, all of them treat cultures as uh, uh, something static with the borders that cannot communicate. It's an argument for incommensurability, for uh, uh, not being able to communicate. Uh, while uh, uh, it is true that there are uh, wide differences between uh, cultures, um, I want to have uh, at the Museum of Care um, so an Italian sociologist that is Marianella Sclavi, somebody I admire very much, uh, who speaks about these differences as ways to uh, get out of the frame uh, of our thoughts. Um, but what's uh, important in this argument for incommensurability is uh, uh, that it gets it as stuck in one, just one culture. While uh, uh, it is true that there are differences, um, for example, a friend of mine that lives in uh, uh, Belfast told me uh, when an Italian uh, um, if you have to contradict somebody in Italy, you just tell uh, him uh, 
you are wrong uh, for this or this uh, other reason. This is very rude in uh, England. You cannot put things uh, this way. But if you put uh, things uh, in the English way in Italy, you simply are, can't be understood. Uh, you seem uh, uncertain of uh, what you are saying. Uh, this is an interesting cultural difference uh, uh, that have to be taken into account and that can be noticed only when uh, Italians go to London. Uh, nevertheless, we are all mixed and uh, there are plenty of interconnections. Uh, uh, our very languages are uh, mixing. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, incommensurability is uh, overestimated. And uh, I have a quote uh, of uh, David's uh, that talks of uh, an incommensurability that uh, not by chance uh, is uh, exactly at the beginning of uh, in the introduction of possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, I often make the argument that at least uh, as a theoretical problem, incommensurability is greatly overrated. Take any two people, even in the same family or community, and you are likely to find half a dozen incommensurable perspectives. None of us completely understand each other. In practice, the fact that we don't uh, rarely gets that we don't rarely gets in the way of our living together, working together, or loving one another, and it is often an actual advantage when people say come together to solve a common practical problem. It's only when we start imagining that the world is somehow generated by the descriptions we make of it, that incommensurability becomes a well night existential dilemma. Of course, the world, the world is, not generally, is not really generated by description we make of it, as most of us are occasionally forced to recognize when some aspect of the world we have not included in our description suddenly contrives us to hit on the head. Uh, I stop reading. I put uh, the quote uh, on the in the it's chat. It's wonderful. I've been following it along. I just had to thank you. It, it, it's I'm, wonderful. Yeah. I, I, I'm so happy that you presented that because it's, um, I think that it is exactly how we need to think about culture. And um, it's, it doesn't come to in, in this article by, by silence, although I think that he probably does see those kinds of issues. Um, he's wanting to make this other argument because he thinks, um, or my understanding is, is that he didn't feel that we were able to recognize and respect culture when it looks a bit different. Um, and that, that's the primary argument he wanted to make. But I have enormous difficulties with his emphasis on order for just the reasons presented in, in the quote that you read. And I think that that is absolutely essential um, to how we need to think about um, culture. And you can find that in other anthropological readings. If people um, are so inclined, um, and, and I, I imagine Simona has already read Pierre Bourdieu at great length, you know, but if you look at the outline of the theory of practice, chapter three, he goes into some of the, the tools through which he uses what he calls the economy of logic for talking about how it is that we can all live together despite things that are apparently incommensurable. So it's, um, we, we have some tools for thinking about that if we want to. And I think that is exactly in these places where we are managing to live together with all of our uniqueness um, that the really cha challenging issues arise. So, so we have it, um, David Graeber said it so eloquently. I'm not going to try to repeat it. So, so thank you so much, Simona, that's perfect. 
I also wanted to uh, go back to the this uh, issue of uh, postmodernism, because um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I find fascinating in David is that his attempt to uh, build big, uh, ask big questions and uh, to make theories. And uh, he often uh, uh, talks uh, of um, Levi-Strauss and uh, he essentially says uh, uh, Levi-Strauss was uh, crazy, uh, had crazy ideas, but he mm -hmm. had uh, the courage to take them uh, until the extreme consequences. And so he created new concepts. And uh, um, it, is, uh, it is true that such a social uh, science can only get a third, three, four cent of uh, reality. And uh, um, you have you always have an enormous reduction of the uh, reality when uh, making theory. Nevertheless, uh, uh, you have to do the, this in order to say something meaningful and new about reality. So, uh, and this is something uh, um, in a way David circles around uh, in, I think in all of this work, uh, I, I think it's very interesting and uh, I still haven't really got what he's uh, seeing, saying. And uh, I don't know if, if I agree, but this idea uh, you cannot, uh, the essential is to create new concepts to, uh, to say something new and meaningful about reality uh, that strikes me as uh, important. And, uh, and that's what the, that's what the postmodernist asks us to do, to open up a new space to see something new, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, he um, actually, where he speaks about, uh, oh, he doesn't speak about, he just says, uh, what I'm doing there uh, is uh, something uh, very bad from a postmodernist modernist point of view. He says this in uh, um, They Don't Know Everything. And uh, um, actually, when uh, he discuss, they discuss uh, traditions and the um, traditionalist uh, approach to the evolution of society. Uh, right, and uh, um, right about the um, possibility to draw uh, wider theories uh, encompassing uh, uh, many aspects of, uh, of human uh, society. Well said, would anyone care to follow up? One last thing, uh, since nobody's uh, getting in. Um, the very concept of schismogenesis comes from an article uh, of Bateson's mm -hmm. that is about <clears throat> cultural, uh, cultural differences and uh, how to deal with uh, the respect of uh, indigenous culture, culture and um, its uh, difference from Western culture. And it, it arose, I, I understand, out of your field work in New Guinea. So it had ethnographic reality as well. It steps toward an ecology of mind. Um, that's okay. something you've been active on chat. Do you want to leap in? 
And I think there is also a psychological dimension with the Bates as well. Um, I think psychologists are using Bates and Sir concept of schismogenesis quite a lot as well to understand why people argue endlessly. So um, you can basically find this notion in many humanities if you want. Um, I will, yeah, in the chat, I was just talking about functionalism because uh, I mean, going back to what uh, Michael uh, was talking about a while ago. I don't, I don't know. So we, we were talking about societies and culture. I think we've seen, we've said everything about, I mean, everything that could be said about that. I mean, usually we, usually we use like this, uh, like the definitions by, um, like Taylor's definition of cult, um, of, um, of culture, right? In anthropology, it's like, um, I think this is, he calls it like some sort of a complex of knowledge, beliefs, um, moral, art, laws, etc. And then basically, uh, culture is what you need to 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 get integrated into a society. And this is why I was like um, um, emphasizing this um, this quote in uh, in the end of the, at the end of the article by Silence, which is like I think I mean quite is. It's quite, it's, it's quite good to understand the difference between the two uh, concepts. So, well, yeah, there is a, well, there's yeah. a problem with, with in culture, I, I don't think is, I, I think a lot of the time when it's talked about, and certainly when it's talked about in a theoretical context, it's very objectified and um, reified in, in a way that isn't very helpful. So that it, it I think all of these kinds of arguments and, and um, the quote that you provided were just so eloquent and well selected. And then, you know, the, the bit from from Graeber as well point us in very different directions. So it, it, it's tricky. We can't completely we can't do without thinking about the cultural and the symbolic dimensions of our lives and how they're shared with other people. But a lot of the discourse we have about that doesn't always seem to be very helpful. <laughs> so, so that is one of the things that we're, we're burdened with. So, um, so this article is an intervention in and a critique of all kinds of things where, where silence feel people haven't quite got it right. And it's, um, I, I think the passionate core of it is about respecting other people and what is meaningful to people, even if they're thinking things that aren't exactly the same as what one thinks oneself. And that that's the, the positive motivation in, in what is written here and the reason why it matters. And it matters because it always matters to people in the way in which they're, we're creating our lives. Um, and the trick is that you can't entirely reduce it to that kind of simple statement because culture is so incredibly complicated. And so we still need to look at its specificity. And that I think is why what anthropologists mostly do is ethnography. You know, because all, when you, what you, you can't, it, it's so difficult to talk about culture meaningfully in the abstract, but you can try to engage people and their lives in a, a deeply um, as one engages with, with people in one's, in one's life. And out of that, one may be able to arrive at something. The, the, the really important anthropology that gets done, in my view, is usually um, in an ethnographic context. Um, and where we get something else, you know, I don't know how David Graeber could have written what he wrote without having been an accomplished ethnographer, you know, so that that is it's that kind of engagement with what other people might find incommensurable or really is just very difficult to grasp. The effort to do it, the commitment to do it, you know, to to being and living with other people in the world together. I think that is the ultimate anthropological question: How do we live in the world together with other people? And you know, understanding culture is. Um, I think one of the, the tools we uh, need to have to do that, it might now and then mean reading a dreary article. 
you know, some of the time we can read less dreary articles, you know, so we can read possibilities or, or, or the dawn of everything. Uh, uh, David Graeber talks about culture in 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 other uh, other pieces. I, I think I think this paper was interesting to read um, uh, because um, because it seems to me that uh, 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 David Graeber um, actually used many of the things that are in this paper. Um, mm -hmm. You have this discussion at the beginning about you know coming from Elias's book. Um, and you know the distinction between culture and civil civilization, and this is something that uh, he was talking about it um, all the time, uh, including in this course on on the value. Um, the idea that that uh, culture, uh, you know, culture as a consumption is something that uh, uh, martial science discuss discusses in this paper, and uh, David Graeber also did it in a. In, in his paper on consumption, and then the idea of culture as a as creative refusal, which is something that he gets from here, uh, but also from Moss and, and Bateson. And so I, I found all that quite interesting. Uh, that um, yeah, th I think these are the these are the two or three things that Graeber uh, remembered from uh, from um, from Salins, I think. It's been uh, becoming clear to me during during the the reading we've been doing together the extent to which they're an active conversation and they don't always, they're not always citing each other, but they're citing the same people. And they're obviously in a much closer dialogue than you could deduce without um, re reading all of it at the same time. So there's a continuous deep conversation that's going on there. Um, and that, that's really helpful, Vasily. Simona has her hand up again. No, from before. Um, is there anything else, or have we hammered this into the ground for now? I just want to say I appreciated the um, the comedy style argumentative things, like you, like in, like it was an. Like I guess if you, it's not, it's published in a journal, but it was a, a speech where you get a little bit more license than in an academic journal to have a certain amount of comedy, sarca really in a, a kind of sarcasm type way. Some of the, um, some of the jokes that he tells, um, or um, you know, he's definitely um, so. So it's quite funny the idea that of. Um, you talk about schismogenesis. He's in the process of taking one half of the anthropology and having a bit of more schismogenesis against the other half. That, you know, if you if you will, um, which you know, the idea that we have to let's all you know get along with everyone else, or let's respect everyone's culture. It's it's quite it's still quite an argumentative piece. So there's a certain amount of irony there, which I don't think is bad, but I just. I thought it was a, a useful thing to see that he's he's making a bunch of points as an argument in relationship to other people and trying to move something. Yes, it's quite, it, despite the academic prose, at certain places it's really quite vivid, isn't it? Sort of shocking us into thinking something different with the irony or whatever. Sorry to exhaust everyone. Um, what, what I struggle with is how we define culture or how we define others' culture. And I don't even feel, as sort of an individual from the West, able to define my culture with confidence. And so I, I struggle with how I can define someone else. Does that make sense? I don't that, think there's that, any need at all to, 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 to define any culture. culture. Yeah, I, I don't think we have to do that. Um, and yeah. I don't think it's strictly bounded in, in that kind of way. And that's perhaps one of the problems that we have with thinking of it as a thing and, and why um, I, I try often to avoid the word. Um, so, you know, there's this, 
it's some kind of imaginary reality in which we all live separately and we all have separate cultures. And clearly that's not how anybody lives. And um, people probably never lived that way. They always had neighbors and some gradations and some things you share with some people and some things you share with others. Um, and within absolutely any bit of one's cultural life, there are differences. If you think about how we get initially in, in, enculturated into anything, it is with parents who are who could be more different from ourselves as, as we're starting out. So from the very beginning of the way in which we encounter culture, it is in, it is it is differentiated um, and differently shared and differently positioned, so that it is incredibly open and fluid. And then there's some people with whom you share more elements, and others with whom you share others. The notion of putting up boundaries, I think, is really quite strange. Although it certainly is true that you know some people may you know if all you interact with are other people with whom you have an awful lot of shared experience and then you go off and encounter people um, who are entirely new to you there's going to be some kind of culture shock and inability to comprehend but I don't think we I, I think we have to think about cultural boundaries because People so insist on thinking about them now, um, but I don't know that we want to give them any a priori reason. reality. And I mean, the other thing um, to mention is that at least in um, in North America, and it's one of the things many anth American anthropologists have, have, have commented on, is that um, culture is standing in for race in many, very many ways, and um, that's now something you know that. I think it's standard to deal with in introductory courses to get people um, not to, to be critical about the way in which culture is used in that particular way. So I'm sure we could end on something more cheerful, such yeah, as border so crossing. You know, you know, we, I mean, we, 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 we get the chance to be so, um, to have our lives so enriched by um, elements of other people's cultures that we, um, it, it can engage with in, in various different ways uh, in the present and extraordinary opportunities to create new elements of culture. Um, so it, it's not all some, a, a ball and chain. It's, you know, it, it's something else as well. Okay, so I think maybe um, we've raised lots of important um, issues and um, uh, have an interesting discussion to take away with us. And um, unless there are any other last words, shall we uh, call it a, an afternoon or an evening or a morning, wherever we are? Thanks to everybody for coming today and uh, see you on some future occasion. <laughs>